Good evening to you all, ladies and gentlemen. It's, it's good to see you here as we consider the subject this evening, the Bible and the papacy. First of all, if we can just give you a, a very brief introduction to who the Christadelphians are. This talk has been arranged uh, by the Christadelphians. Uh, we are a group of believers who take the Bible to be the inspired word of God. We base our lives on it. We base our beliefs on it. Uh, and this evening, as we consider this subject, I'd like to just make it absolutely clear that this is no personal attack on the Pope. This is no attack on the, the beliefs of, of Roman Catholics. It, we, our simple desire is that you open the Bible for yourselves, that you read it, that you consider it, um, that you think about its message. Because we believe the Bible has a wonderful message. It brings the hope of God's coming kingdom on earth and God's offer to each one of us to be a part of that. So we believe it's very important that we consider its message. Now just to give you an idea of what's going to be happening uh, this evening, uh, we're going to have two talks. As you see, we have two speakers uh, here this evening. First of all, uh, Mr. Mark Alfrey is going to speak on the subject, Is the Pope the True Head of the Church? Then we're going to have a short break um, for refreshments. There's tea and coffee served in a room off to the side. Um, and then Mr. Matt Davies is going to speak on the subject, Church Tradition or Bible Teaching. And so without further ado, I'm going to ask Mark to speak to us on the subject, Is the Pope the True Head of the Church? Mark, please. Well, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen and friends. Thank you for coming along this evening. This week, I believe, we are witnessing one of the most remarkable events in the history of the country that we live in. And of course I'm talking about the first ever state visit of the Pope, the leader of the Roman Catholic Church to Great Britain. And as we know, this is only the second time the Pope has set foot on British soil. And this time he's been welcomed, in fact invited, by British royalty, no less, and by the government of this country. And the popular response to the Pope's visit, I believe, is giving us a rare insight into the power of the Roman Catholic Church, even in this supposedly Protestant country. And it may be that the established churches in this country will be encouraged to form closer ties with Rome as a result of this papal visit. And so remarkable is this event that the Christadelphians, whom Matt and David and I represent, felt that it would be worthwhile spending some time this evening considering the validity of the claims of the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope in particular when viewed against the teaching of the Bible. Now, I'd like to make one thing clear at the outset, and that is that, as David has just said, what we have to say tonight is in no way intended to be a character judgment of the Pope as a person, or indeed any other member of the Roman Catholic Church. What we've got to say tonight concerns the Pope as an institution, the papacy, in other words, the institution that claims for its incumbent the title Head of God's Church. Now let's be very clear what, in fact, the Roman Catholic Church teaches about the authority of the papacy. Now one of the most authoritative of all Roman Catholic statements is that of the Council of Trent, which was held nearly 500 years ago now and concerning the Pope it declares that he hath power, he hath all power on earth. All temporal power is his. The dominion, jurisdiction and government of the whole earth is his by divine right. All rulers of the earth are his subjects and must submit to him. Now what an amazing thing to say. 
So according to the Council of Trent, the Pope is the ultimate authority on the earth. He holds all power and all other world governments are subservient to the Pope. Now, the foundation for this remarkable claim lies in the Roman Catholic belief that the Lord Jesus Christ appointed the Apostle Peter to be head of the Christian Church and that the Pope is Peter's legitimate successor. And so again, the Council of Trent declares that the Roman pontiff himself is the successor of the blessed Peter, Prince of the Apostles and the true Vicar of Christ. To him was given by the Lord Jesus Christ full power to feed, rule and govern the universal church. And so that's what the Catholic Church believes. It actually believes that when the Pope speaks forth on matters of morals and of doctrine, that he speaks with divine authority and power. And they call this speaking ex cathedra. In other words, what the Pope says on such matters is infallible. So, for example, the Vatican Council of 1870 has this to say regarding the infallibility of the Pope. It says, we teach and define that it is a dogma divinely revealed that the Roman pontiff, when he speaks ex cathedra, is possessed of that infallibility with which the divine redeemer willed that his church should be endowed for defining doctrines regarding faith and morals. And so this is what the papacy today claims. The Pope claims to be the ultimate authority on the earth. He believes that he is the legitimate successor to Saint Peter, the Apostle. And as such, he claims to be the head, ruler and pastor of the church. And furthermore, when he speaks on matters of faith and morals, the Pope claims to speak infallibly with God-given authority. Now this claim is based in particular upon Matthew chapter 16, which we now need to just spend a few moments looking at. Because the Catholic Church teaches primarily on the basis of this Bible reference in Matthew chapter 16, that Jesus gave to the Apostle Peter special unique authority and that Peter was to be the foundation upon which the church, the Christian church, was to be built. And this authority has continued to be exercised in the Catholic Church through the papacy. So that's what the Roman Catholic Church believes. So let's have a look now at Matthew chapter 16. It says there that he, that's Jesus, saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so the Catholic Church teaches, on the basis of these words of Jesus, that Peter is the rock upon which the church is built. And of course what we have here is a play upon words, because the New Testament was originally written in the Greek 
language. And Peter's name in Greek is Petros, which means a stone. But we need to be very clear that Jesus did not say, Thou art Petros, and upon this Petros will I build my church. What Jesus actually said was this. He said, Thou, Peter, art Petros, and that's a masculine word, which means a stone. And upon this Petra, and that's a feminine word, which means a solid rock, upon this Petra I will build my church. And so I would like to suggest to you that Jesus is not saying at all that the church was going to be built upon Peter. So what then is the rock upon which Jesus would build his church? Well, surely it's the confession of faith that Peter had just expressed, that Jesus was the Christ. Remember what Peter said? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I would suggest that that, in fact, is the foundation upon which the church is built. And in fact, we can see this quite clearly um, from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 3, where he said in verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And so that's the teaching of the scriptures. There is only one foundation for the true church, and that is Jesus Christ himself, the Son of the living God. But we might say, well, what about the, verse, the, the words that, Pete, that uh, Jesus went on to speak to Peter in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19? Jesus said to Peter, And I will give unto thee the keys... Of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven and we could say well doesn't this suggest that Jesus did in fact give to Peter special unique authority and of course the Roman Catholic Church will say yes that is the case and the Pope whom they claim is the successor of Peter, similarly enjoys such authority. Which is why, of course, the papacy uses as its emblem the symbol of the two crossed keys. But is this really what Jesus meant? Certainly it's true that Jesus gave authority to Peter, and, and we read of Peter in the New Testament exercising his authority, for example, in the Acts of the Apostles. But the point is, it was not unique authority. It was an authority that Peter shared with all of the Apostles. And so, for example, in Acts chapter 26, the Apostle Paul was given specific authority from the Lord Jesus Christ to preach to the Gentiles. Jesus said to Paul, he said, But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee unto the, from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. And so as Paul went about preaching the gospel in obedience to the commandment of the Lord Jesus Christ, we read that he was able to open the door of faith to the Gentiles. And so here was Paul the Apostle, using the keys of the kingdom of heaven to give the hope of salvation to the Gentiles. Now take another example. Take this verse from Matthew chapter 18 and verse 18 because here 
the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to all of his disciples, not just Peter. And notice what he says to them. He says, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so what Jesus is saying here is that all of the disciples, not just Peter, but all of the disciples had the privilege of preaching the gospel and of inviting men and women to inherit the kingdom of God and to be released from the bondage of sin and death. And so we conclude that whilst it's true that Jesus gave to Peter the responsibility to preach the gospel and to call men and women to repentance, that responsibility was not unique to Peter. And indeed it was shared by all of the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now furthermore, although Peter, as we've just seen, was given the authority to preach, along with the rest of the apostles, he clearly was not given infallible authority from the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know this because in the epistle to the Galatians in chapter 2, the apostle Paul there tells us of one significant occasion when Peter refused to share fellowship with Gentile believers for fear of upsetting the Jewish Christians. And what Peter did was wrong, so much so that it seems that the Apostle Paul had to tell him off. And so it says here in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11, Paul says that when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Now how does that square with the Roman Catholic notion of the infallibility of the papacy. Because whilst I accept that the papacy only claims infallibility when speaking specifically on matters of faith and morals, surely here in Galatians chapter 2, this is just that. You see, this was an important matter of faith and Morality, because the question of whether or not the Gentiles should be accepted into the church as well as the Jews, well, that was one of the most important issues that the Christian church faced in the first century. And, and Peter's behaviour could well have been a cause for offence to many of the Gentile believers with whom he refused to have fellowship. And so I would submit that we wouldn't therefore have expected the Apostle Paul to have had to rebuke Peter in connection with this matter if Peter was the first infallible Pope. Now, when we come to the writings of Peter himself, what do we find? Well, Peter wrote two epistles in the New Testament. And when we read them through, there's not the slightest hint that Peter regarded himself as having any special, any particular authority from God. For example, in the first epistle, in chapter 5, he says this. He says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. And so clearly Peter didn't see himself as any greater or any more important than any of the other elders in the church. They all shared this responsibility 
to feed the flock of God. And, and note in particular what he says in verse 3. He says, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being ensamples to the flock. So they weren't to lord it over the other members of the church. Now what did it say in the Council of Trent regarding the papacy? He hath all power on earth, all temporal power is his. The dominion, jurisdiction and government of the whole earth is his by divine right. So hardly the sort of behaviour that Peter is advocating here in his first epistle. Now this brings us to another important point, and that is that even if we could show from the scriptures that Peter did hold a unique and an infallible position in the early church, even if we could show that, there is not the slightest suggestion in the Bible that anyone was to be ordained by Jesus Christ to succeed him. The Bible is absolutely silent on that matter. And in fact, in his second letter, the Apostle Peter spoke about what was to happen after he had died. And it says there in chapter 1 of his second letter, Peter says, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. And he's talking about his death. Peter was about to be put to death for his faith. That's what he's saying there. Now, what did he go on to say? Did he say, well, when I'm dead, ordain a successor and listen to him and submit to him? Well, no, he didn't. What Peter said was, listen to the scriptures. That's what he says in verse 19. He says, we have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth. And so I would submit to you that there is absolutely no evidence in the Bible that there was to be, there was ever intended to be, a succession of popes who would rule the church with infallible God-given authority. So in summary, what we can say so far is that the scriptures do not teach that there was to be a succession of popes. They don't teach the supremacy of Peter. They do not support the Pope's claim to be the successor of Peter or that the Pope is the head of the church. And so we would submit to you that the Pope's claim to be the head of the church is entirely without foundation. Rather, we believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and he alone has been exalted as the head of the church. Let's just have a look at a selection of verses from the New Testament that teach this concerning Jesus. First of all, Philippians chapter 2 says there, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22 says that God hath put all things under his feet, under Jesus' feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15, grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23 he says, for as the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. And just one more from Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. Concerning Jesus, it says, he is the head of the body, the church, that in all things he might have the preeminence. 
And so I would submit to you that the teaching of the Scriptures really is quite clear that Jesus Christ, not the Pope, is the head of the church. Well, if what we're saying is true, then does the Bible not have anything to say at all about the papacy? Well, in fact, yes, it does. And if you look at the second letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 2, you find there a prophecy concerning the development of the papal system. And as we'll see, the Bible speaks of the papacy in a, in a rather unflattering way. Now, what's the background to this letter? Well, at the time, there were some Christians in the first century who were claiming, in fact, that the day of Christ's coming was then present, that Jesus Christ had already come back to the earth. And, in fact, some members of the church had gone to the length of creating fraudulent letters from the Apostle Paul to submit, to support this claim that they were making. And this was false teaching. And it was dangerous because it raised false hopes in the minds of the early Christians. And it could well have led some early believers to turn their backs on the Christian faith altogether. And so in 2 Thessalonians 2, this is what we read in verse 1. Paul says, Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. So this is what was happening. People were claiming that Christ had already come. Now what the Apostle Paul goes on to do in this chapter is to explain that the day of the Lord's coming could not possibly have already come because something else had to happen first. Notice what he says there in verse 3. He says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. And so Paul's message was this. He was saying, don't be deceived by those who are saying that the day of Christ has already come. Because before Christ can come, there must be a falling away. There must be an apostasy. There had to be a departure from the true faith and the development of a false religious system that the Apostle Paul here calls the man of sin, the son of perdition. So the question is, well, who is this man of sin? Who is this son of perdition? Well, I believe that Paul tells us enough in this chapter for us to be able to conclude that it is in fact a reference to the papacy in its capacity as the head of the Roman Catholic Church. Notice first of all that Paul said that the man of sin would be revealed as a result of a falling away from the faith. In other words, it would originate from within that community that at one time held the truth. Now, here we have, I believe, the first clue that helps us to positively identify the man of sin because it is a fact that the Roman Catholic Church is the only religious organisation that can claim on broken historical continuity with the original apostolic first century church. In fact, it prides itself on this claim, on this fact. The Catholic Church claims 
that its historical continuity with the first century Christian church proves that it is the true church of Christ. But I would suggest that it does nothing of the sort. Rather, what it proves is that the seeds of apostasy that were sown in the first century church in fulfilment of the words of Paul are now manifest in the Roman Catholic system. In other words, we should look for the man of sin within the Catholic Church. Now have a look at what Paul says in verse 7. He says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. So in other words, even in the days of the Apostle Paul, back in the first century, as he was writing this letter, the apostasy had begun to develop within the church in the first century. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. So there it was, beginning to develop in the early church. But then, look at verse 8. He says, And then shall be revealed the lawless one, whom the Lord Jesus shall slay with the breath of his mouth, and bring to naught by the manifestation of his coming. So Paul now explains that Jesus, when he comes again, is going to bring to naught the lawless one by the manifestation of his coming. Now, it's now 2010, and we're still waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what this means is that the man of sin, which had begun to develop during the days of the Apostle Paul, will still be in existence in the day of Christ's coming. And on that basis, I would suggest to you that the man of sin has to represent a succession of lawless ones that have existed continually, continuously for over 2,000 years. And the unbroken succession of popes from the first century to the present day is, I believe, the man of sin. Now, if we're right, if we're right in identifying the man of sin as the Roman Catholic Church, then we might wonder why it's described in such a forthright way. Why the man of sin? Well, it's because of the claims that the man of sin makes for itself. In fact, if we look at 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4, we see there that it's described as opposing and exalting himself above all that is called God, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, setting himself forth as God. So this is what the man of sin was to do, would oppose and exalt himself above God. And this, I would suggest, is an exact description of the extravagant claims that the papacy makes for itself. Claims that are not made by any other religious organisation. In fact, Pope Leo XIII, in an encyclical letter, said... We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. And look at this quote. The Pope is crowned with a triple crown as King of heaven and earth and of the lower regions. The Pope is, as it were, God on earth, sole sovereign of the faithful of Christ, chief King of kings, having plenitude of power, to whom has been entrusted by the omnipotent God direction not only of the earthly, but even of the heavenly kingdom. And so he claims, apparently, to have authority even over the heavenly kingdom. And it's worth repeating the point that no other religious organisation claims to have such authority. And as for 
sitting in the temple of God, well, this is precisely how St. Peter's Basilica in Rome is regarded. It's in St. Peter's that the Pope sits to make his supposedly infallible pronouncements. Now, Paul also says there in that verse 4 that the man of sin would oppose those that worship God. And the word that Paul uses really means an adversary. And it is a fact that the Roman Catholic Church has taken a very uncompromising view on those who do not subscribe to its beliefs. All who reject the teaching of the Catholic Church are regarded as heretics and the Church has been guilty in ages past of seeking to exterminate such people. We can think, for example, of the Spanish Inquisition and the Catholic Church's attempt to suppress the translation of the Bible into English. We know that brave men were burnt at the stake because of their efforts to translate the Bible into the common tongue. Ladies and gentlemen, these things really did happen with the blessing of the Catholic Church. Well, finally, let's have a look at verse 9 of 2 Thessalonians 2, because there we're given a couple of further clues as to the identification of the man of sin. It says there, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And that quotation that we looked at from the Council of Trent illustrates that the papacy does claim to possess all power on earth. And furthermore, the Catholic Church claims to have the power to perform signs and wonders. And I'm sure we've all heard of alleged cures that have taken place at Lourdes, of supposed miraculous appearances of the Virgin Mary, of the discovery of ancient relics that are supposed to possess supernatural qualities. These things are the hallmark of the Roman Catholic system. But as the Apostle Paul says there, these things are not miracles at all. But the sad thing is that many people have unwittingly been deceived by such things. And they've been encouraged to put their faith and trust in things that have no basis in truth at all. So, as we just bring our thoughts in this first session to a conclusion, what have we seen? First of all, we've seen that the true head of the church is not the Pope, but the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And... We've also seen that the continued existence of the Roman Catholic Church through the centuries actually confirms the accuracy of the Bible. And it gives us the confidence to believe that the Bible really is what it claims to be, and that is the word of the living God. The Bible said that before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, there would be a falling away from the faith. And I would suggest to you that the development of the Roman Catholic Church is, we believe, that system. Now we're going to take a short break now and afterwards Matt is going to show us in a little bit more detail how the teachings and the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church differ from what the Bible really says. <laughs> 